Jackson, our current secretary. Okay, so we'll get on to the program here. And uh, our speaker for tonight is Dan Heckler, and he's our secretary here at CAS. And Dan's topic for this evening will be easy as AEC, improve your views and images of planets, the moon, and other objects using atmospheric dispersion correction. Okay? Yeah, you read that again. So. <laughs> You have really no experience required for secretary. If you can take notes, what you learn in college, take notes, that'll get you through it. Or you can bring a recorder and record it and just do it at your leisure. Okay, my name is Dan Heckler. Uh, I probably never would have, if, if you get experience being secretary, you find out what's going on, I probably never would have volunteered to give this talk because if, if I hadn't done it. And uh, I just figured I didn't even know about know, There's so many people here with so much knowledge. Believe me, they don't know anyone who needs to watch. These people know a lot. Okay, uh, our uh, our vice president Don Leonard came up with this name, Easy as ADC, and I figured that's probably if you remember one thing, that's probably what you'll remember. So this is a way to improve your view of the planets, stars, bright stars, bright objects in space, and. I'm going to talk to you about it a little bit, tell you what they are, why you need one, what, what difference it makes. But you can see this telescope is aimed right at Saturn. Put Saturn's over here. Why does that happen? Well, let's go through it. Do you these buttons? Oh, yeah. okay. The right arrow. Right arrow, okay. That's not that right. Okay. Oh, I need this little one over here. Maybe it should have been four years. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all you need to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> right, got to go right to the Okay, uh, first time I saw that, it was on a cheap department store, store telescope, $100 telescope, you know, and the, every time took a step, it's wobbling all over the place, but I found Saturn, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was a cheap scope, the view wasn't anything, but it got me hooked, that's why I'm standing here today. And, but the thing is, if you have looked at Saturn, I don't care how good your equipment is, if you don't have this piece of equipment, you're not getting the view that you think you could, you're not getting what you could be getting out of your, uh, out of your equipment. So we've got all kinds of problems, Related to telescopes, coma, astigmatism, uh, chromatic deviation effects, and all kinds of things. And now we got more to worry about. The atmosphere. We know about things clouds, block your view. Transparency, the total water vacuum vapor in your air, in the air. You need to have a low amount of, of water in the air for low contrast objects, galaxies, nebulas, stuff like that. You can have not bad broken clusters and planetary nebula. You can have poor transfer. You can have a lot of water in the air and still see planets. Seeing, that's just the opposite. Seeing, you don't need good seeing for stars and things like that, but for planets you need good seeing. Otherwise it looks like you've got something under in a bowl of water and the surface is rippling and it doesn't quite give you the view that you want. That's the scene that talks about the upper the turbulence in the atmosphere. Uh, smoke from wildfires, that just makes everything hazy. You just don't get the view that you want. Whoops, did I go too far? No, I went too far, didn't I? More problems, temperature, problems with mirror equilibrium, tube, tube currents, electronics, humidity, dew on your optics, it makes ground fog, then you can't see as well. Wind stability has a problem for stability for log dots, for long focal length, uh, refractors, things like that. Air pollution pollutants are view. You got light pollution that obscures your view. All these things in the atmosphere. And now we got more. The atmosphere is a prism. All those other problems 
you can take care of one way or the other. All your problems with your telescope, you can take care of one way or the other. But the atmosphere, like that first picture shows you, and this one doesn't treat you quite as well, but this guy's looking through it, and it starts out looking like this, and then it separates into three different colors, and this is what he sees, or she. <coughs> the observer is going to just see a blurry view, and it's going to look pretty good, because you got a nice telescope, but it's not going to be as good as you can get. We have, let me see, let me see if I got one. Yeah, or so. Wrong way. Gotta keep going right. Okay, the atmosphere is a prism, and it splits the things up into different colors. And it does it, 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 it separates the colors because, okay, so this one says altitude above the horizon. How high is that object you're looking at? So zero degrees all the way up to 90 degrees. And this one says how much. How much does the apt, the prism of the atmosphere, how much does it change? Uh, how much does it change the light rate according to each color? Each color bends at a different rate in the atmosphere. And this chart tells you that when you're at really low, you know, here's 30 degrees right here. Look how far red is from blue. You're, you're, you're not getting a clear, you're not getting focus. And you know, by the time you get up here. To 45 degrees, that's you still got a pretty good separation, and this tells you how many arc seconds. So this is like a half an arc second or, or more of separation. So for really small telescopes, that half an arc second she won't even be able to see. If you got a 60 millimeter, forget it. 85. Once you start getting to four inches and above, that's when you may start to notice it. But you get down here, even even at 60 degrees, you know, it's, it's getting up pretty high now. For visual, that's, you're not going to be able to see the difference, but when you get your camera out, you're going to have problems. It's going to split it up to view. And this is the same thing, 0, 30, 45, 60, 75 degrees, showing you in arc seconds how, how, how far apart these things, uh, how far apart these colors get by the time they reach you. And I'm still describing the problem here. Uh, dispersion across past bands again, blue, green, red. It shows you the zenith. This one kind of flips it over. Instead of telling you how high you up, they're saying distance from the zenith. So how far down do you come from the zenith? So by the time you come down to 40, 60 degrees, you've got a big dispersion. You guys all follow this? Makes sense? And then this just does the same thing, except it does it in uh, numbers. Makes sense? All right, the solution, ta-da, the atmospheric dispersion corrector. So the atmosphere is a prism. What do we do? Why not just uh, turn it around? Make it go the other way. When the atmosphere corrector has no, has no, no corrections, you've got a blurry picture. And when it takes those and focuses them, see these... This, the, it's a prism, and they line up the prisms. Depending on how they line up the prism, it can uh, change, it can compress those, refocus those light waves back into all the same color, and then you get that star you were looking at for a bright star. This is a ZWO, and it's the same thing as many of them. This is the kind of thing, maximal correction, you've got the two prisms like this. Rest position, it just lets the light go through like there's nothing, so you can leave that on there. You leave that atmospheric dispersion for it's not going to hurt you as long as you don't have it doing anything. Okay. Let's see where we get this. All right. How did this start? You guys ever heard of George Airy? Mm -hmm. Airy disc? I always talk about the Airy disc, little circles you're supposed to see around the stars. It's the same guy. He figured out, he was trying to figure out Mercury transitions and where Mercury's going to appear. He was doing all these calculations and he figured out that. When it's, you know, Mercury is always near the horizon. He figured out he wasn't really seeing where it was. So he figured out what it was. He figured out it was the atmosphere. And he said, okay, I'm going to make a little prism. So he took a little prism, you know, like one of those things I had on the previous thing. It's a little piece of glass that's not, not flat. He took a prism and he made it for two degrees all the way up to six, just single prism. So that when it passed through, he would correct for uh, two degrees all the way up to 16 degrees. He made little prisms. 
Now, it was only good for that one altitude, but he could make the frisbee. He knew, he knew it would work. He was, uh, he was the first one that I could find. I did a lot of research on this. I'm not an astronomer. We've got a real astronomer here, though. The United States Air Force made a patent in 1980 on a real fancy one. I didn't get the details. Once again, I have an accounting degree, not a astronomy. In 2005, the Adirondack Video Astronomy, that's what they call themselves, Video Astronomy. Um, I guess they're a Video Astronomy Club, but it doesn't say club. So they made the PADC a planetary ADC. And they described it in an article, and I read all about it, and, and he, you know, the guy that's writing the article, he talks about why this works and why it doesn't. Pretty much he's telling the same kind of stuff I am, because I, mean, I read this article, I'm trying to give you what he does. Um, so that was, that was the first one that you could find if you were into astronomy enough that you, you know, looked that stuff up. Other brands started around 2010 and later. This is one from that I didn't even know they made until I started researching. This is from Denmark and ADK, because in Denmark, their corrupters start with Ks. Great star, that's one. That's a five, 500 euros, I think, something like that. No, no, no that one is 1,300 euros. And you, that, that U.S. Air Force thing you didn't think sure about, that actually relates to uh, spy camera technology on the satellite for doing but they did, yeah, and they didn't phrase it that way in the patent application, which no, I read. No, no, they did. But that's what it talked about very large telescopes and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, you got to figure that's what they're using it for. Um, maybe they even do it looking down. I guess we're about that too. It's not this being okay. Uh, there are. Oh, I forgot to mention the uh, ABC here. Almost every version you see is going to look like this because. Once Astro Systems Holland made the first version of this, ZWO and now half a dozen Chinese corporations are making knockoffs. So you can find that one. This great star ABC, uh, I don't know who made it first, but there's a Piero Astro in uh, France that makes one that operates the same way. And then this is a, actually a auto atmosphere report on a good against ABC, which I don't have a picture of one, but it's right here. And this is the first one ever made. It was ABC number one, mine was number 40. But the Strel is 99.994. If Strel tells you how much of the light goes all the way through. So if Strel is one, it's perfect. Everything goes through. You nothing, nothing, no, nothing lets everything through. 0.999 is five as, as high as you'll find. I have one of these reports for my good against ABC at minus point. 999 Strel. The rest of these only come up with usually 70, 80 Strel, something like this, because of the glasses they're using. Because they're not putting a lot of money into it. They're using good glasses, but not enough. This is, like I said, the evolution of ABC, right? Electronic ABC. So it's a lot like the ZWO and, and the Astro Systems Holland. It's got those things in here, and it's got a nose piece and an eyepiece. And you can put your camera in the eyepiece wherever you want, but it's electronic, so you don't have to fiddle with it. And you set it up the first time, you adjust it, and then after that, it's it's going to move those uh, pieces of glass, those prisms around for you. This is one that uh, I can't read this very well, but this is a fluid ABC where they're using two different viscosity fluids to have the same effect as glass. And it's on a very large, it was a write-up that I saw. I'm just saying, like I'm saying, the evolution of these ABC. This is another picture of that one. It just doesn't come out very clear, but you can see that. And you can't see very well, but here's the fluid line. So they got all kinds of ways to do this. And when you get to huge telescopes, 30 millimeter telescopes and the extremely large telescopes, they have very fancy ABCs. I'm just talking mostly about stuff that you might use. Okay, do they work? They work, or what do they work on? Bright planets, bright stars, bright objects in the sky, the moon. Uh, so here's a, here's a uh, picture, and I, I plagiarize all this. None of this is my work. I don't have references. I can come up with a, what do you call it, bibliography if we need. 
But here's a picture of Sirius, blue, green, red. I don't know how well you can see it from back there, but it's got the rainbow here. And then with, if you take away the atmospheric dispersion, you get that star with the area disk. Same thing here, we got the zenith angle, seven degrees off the zenith, it looks pretty good. You get the 33 degrees off the zenith, you can start seeing it separate colors. Here's the 52 degrees off the zenith. And that's with a fluid AEC that's showing these. So yeah, it does, it does seem to do its work. You Mars, you can see, let's see, figure four. How did this work out? This one, this one's uncorrected, this one's corrected, and this one was corrected with a, uh, your uh, imaging programs that align the colors. So you can take your red, green, and blue and align it, and it comes up pretty good. But you can still see, compared to the, take away the dispersion, and there is no fringing over here. These color fringes that you see, all of a sudden, is you see the polarized cap the, the way it should be. The same thing on Saturn, and this is harder to see. This, the whole thing in astronomy, you gotta look real close to see any differences. But this, this is the corrected one, and this one's just all blurry and smearier. And I mean, if you get really close, you can see the bands on Saturn over here, but here it's a smear. So these are things that different atmospheric dispersion correctors do, some more Saturn, and you can see blurrier over here, corrected here. What was this? Oh, this was uh, another Jupiter. And I can't tell how, how easy it is to see from back there. This is all colors, and this is all brownish and whites and a more natural color for Jupiter. And here you see, without ABC, without ABC that has the RGB aligned, and then this is with the ABC. And you know, seeing from where you are, it's really hard to see this stuff. But if you look this up, or better yet, look through the eyepiece yourself, if you don't see the difference, well, I'm not that great an observer, but I can see the difference easily. Solar system objects, bright stars, larger aperture telescopes, altitude for visual usually below 45 degrees. Anything below that, you're going to notice a difference with a larger telescope. Once again, larger aperture telescopes. For imaging, anything below 60 degrees, all the way up there, you're going to it's going to make a difference. What's the problem with it? They use some back focus. I mean, it's a piece. It's a piece of equipment with some glass, and it could be an inch and a half, or it could be close to two inches. But you can put Barlow in there, extend focal length, and still do it. Uh, it prefers focal ratios above, depends on which one you look. Some say above F, focal ratio of 10, some say 15, some say 20 to 40. So the longer the focal ratio, the better you are, once again. If you have a short focal length telescope, use a Barlow. Uh, a positive, a pro, you know, cons, pros, you got a predictable correction of your atmospheric dispersion. You know you can get rid of it. I just call that a, a pro. Uh, now this is, I mean, I don't know how many of you read Cloudy Nights to a bunch of you. Yeah. So Cloudy Nights, if you know, you can look up anything on Cloudy Nights. And this one I brought up just because, wow, this is what I didn't mention. This CWO that I mentioned, Cost about $128. $130, $135, $140 on Amazon. You can find an exhibit like knockoffs, SV, Boney, whatever they call that, and all kinds of different names. You can find that one for $128 to $140. Cost about $128. 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 I don't know why that's so much more expensive. And then this one is the Cadillac. This is the Gutekunst. I just looked it up on Astromart. You can buy it directly from Dr. Martin Gutekunst for $4,500. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Really, why? Yeah. Why? And so this is the 47th reply on this ABC. And I forget the exact name of it, but they were talking about price versus results. What's, what's the point? And this late, this whoever this person is comes on, you know, he says, You have zero cells of PRS for 350 and the 4,000 units. You know, you get for 
For 128 bucks, you can get 90% of the performance of the good against, he said so. And, you know, so why not just do that? Hey, if you have a small telescope, or if you have a cheap telescope, get the cheapest stuff. It's going to make sense. You will get good results from that ZWO. Um, but what they talk about is what that PRISER is made of. It's a different kind of system. And that's the slides that I didn't have. I knew I missed something today. So we showed you the two pieces of glass, right? There's two pieces of glass that turn and make the prism. And I could go back a bunch of slides. You guys remember that slide? Yes. Two pieces of glass. <laughs> so has something that they call plain plates. And they take two pieces of glass with different dispersions. And one will be, you know, one will be narrower at the top and wider at the bottom, one will be narrow, wider at the top and narrow at the bottom. They put them together. And then they have another set of plain plates with the same two glasses, but they're inverted. Where it was on top, where it was thick on top before, now it's thin on top. So they have those right next to each other and they spin those around. I'm going to show you in a minute why that's important. It's also the quality of the glass. Like I said, you get 99 Strel or better on your ADC, Gutekunst ADC. It has a couple other cute little things like here. Like if I got this, if I got this system set up and I want to rotate it, I just spin this. Spin this. Now I can rotate it relative to whatever I got it plugged into. Just little little things like that make it easier for you. I can rotate it up here too. Um, I, as I'm observing, the thing goes from this, and then I'm going over here and turns. So I can just turn it. You just turn it here because this thing's thin. So it's got you know bells and whistles, but it's also got better glass, better technology, better parts. It's heavy. This thing weighs 20 ounces. These things, once you take the caps off, weigh about two and a half or three ounces. I mean, it's glass. I mean, you know what you pay for in this sport. All right, I wanted to bring that up, but she, and she brings up these points. You know, the good of his has mechanically both sets of plain plates. Like she goes through all this kind of different stuff, and then she says, "You have the cheap. If you have an expensive telescope, why are you going to go for the cheapest thing?" And if you want good pictures, you know, same thing. Good images, not just pictures. And there's the question: price, performance. You got an achromatic atmosphere, why buy an apochromatic telescope? You don't have an apochromatic telescope without the ADC, is the point. So, yeah, so it's worth buying it. So, I don't know if I turn that off or just leave it there, but I want to show you guys. I got to use this paper, otherwise, we'll do it all over and I'll waste time. So, I brought a bunch of toys here. Uh, and the first thing I want to do is take the Gero Astro. And one thing I did is I left all these caps on because I know when I started doing this, I don't know how much experience you guys all have, but some people are newer and some people are. And you want to see what people do, you know, how do you, how do you work this? Well, when I take this, it's got, this thing has just one knob and it, it spins, it spins, you know, it spins, or you can move it back and forth. Back up and down like this. And this thing is two things that you, well, you'll see what the movements it does up there in a minute. Uh, and it just, they tell you to put this with that knob over to the side, parallel to the horizon. And that tells this piece of equipment where the horizon is, and that all it has to do is, is compress or decompress the image that you got. So we take this and, well, first of all, we'll start with this. And I got these things, I got a red and blue light, and they're so close together that they'll reflect, you, you can see it's red and blue, but it, ref, it reflects kind of purplish on both, on all sides, because they're one on top of the other. If this thing can really correct for the prismatic effect of the atmosphere, it ought to change the relation of the red and the blue. So it doesn't work. So now it's going through there. It's a little high. Oh, it's about yeah, two inches high. too high. Yeah. yeah. 
Let's, let's, oh, work this way. Oh, let's actually put this through the atmospheric dispersion director. And this is something I noticed with Pierre Astro. The first thing it does is it separates them out. And this is the neutral position, but you can already see here. I mean, can you guys all see it? The blue is separated from the red. You know, when I when I do this, you can see the blue is right next to it, not on top of it anymore. If I go this way, I see the blue first, then the red. First the red, then the blue. You see it separated. I don't know why that is. That's Pierre. That's a maybe I got a bad hand. Got a different one because I was frustrated with this. I look at this when I turn, when I turn this, look at look at how it moves. <coughs> now it's up here. I turn this. That image, that's down there. That's because of those plane plates, the way they do it. It 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 takes it and it shoots it off in different directions. And it, now I'll put it back in the center position and I try to just spin the knob and that moves it also. What I don't get is why this thing isn't doing what it should be doing because I don't see it doing what it should be doing. So I'm not too happy with it. So maybe I get a bad one like I said. CWO, <coughs> and most people are going to get it are going to probably do this. This thing comes with a nose piece, an eyepiece, and the unit itself. And a lot of people assume that means that you should just plop it down right here, take out your eyepiece here, and put this in there and use it like that. Well, got to take off. Use it like that. And people do that. And you can do that. That's not best. The reason that's not best is because this is bending the light rays, and it wants uh, more parallel light rays to come in. But then the, the farther back you put it in your light path, the closer to your eyepiece that you put it, the less time it has to correct that prismatic effect. And it can introduce, from what I've been reading, it can introduce optical distortions because of that. So what you want to do is put it farther back in your image train, but anyway, let me get, get on to this. I'm going to do this, the same thing that I did with the Hero Astro. See, this one is not even, because it's got that ridge. Put a, put a piece. Now this one, when you put it in your system, this white thing tells you where the center is. And you put those both in the center, that's the neutral position. You want, it has a a bubble, a bubble, a level, and it wants that up, and it wants that level, and this tells it where uh, the, where the horizon is, so that it can do the compression. Once you have that bubble here, then it wants you to move these two to do the atmospheric dispersion corrections with this, and you can you can spin these knobs, you can twist these knobs and lock them into place if you want, or loosen them up and let them move a little more easily. I don't see anything to lock it into place, but hey, you do what you want. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move this so that I can, it won't be level. I mean, I won't, I won't make this level, but I want to be able to move these two levers. And of course, these rubber bands are going really high tech, isn't it? So you might notice this time that, did I pull that down or let that thing go? I that's part of it now. Okay. But you can see this time that when I put it through there at the neutral position that this thing is still purple. It's, well, you can see it's split up a little bit. But that blue is almost exactly in the center there. So this doesn't really change it. Oh, I don't have a both at the center point. I'll loosen them up. So once again, you move these knobs, and that thing starts with oh, take my that thing starts moving all over the place. Oh, it's getting closer. And what I'm trying to show is that right here, the blue is just to the left of the red. Right here, the blue is on top of the red, so it's moving its positions. And 
And over here, the blue is kind of on the right of the red, or right and below it. So yes, it's moving the relationship of the blue and the red, so we know it's doing some work. And then basically, that's what I'm trying to show you. I can't show you those pictures that I showed you earlier, because we don't have you know the, the planets in the sky. Now you notice it's moving around all over the place, and that is going to get kind of annoying after a while. How much is that one? This is the ZWO. That's the one that's right around one hundred thirty dollars. Now this is so this you, you have to align these up to the horizon, right? They have to know where the horizon is yes. because if you're not doing it at the right angle, then then you're just going to be messing with the. That you're going to be skewing the dispersion you're rather just, than actually lining. Yes, that's it's, the prisms will just skew it. You want it, okay. you want it to know where the horizon is so that it can compact it back down. Set the prism. Does it change the correction in one direction only? It corrects it vertically only. I have not. a oh, vertical. Yeah, vertical is you'll. So you'll end up with you'll you'll end up with it unless you, you get a mirror in your system. Depending on what kind of telescope you have. You'll have blue on the top, green in the middle, red on the bottom. Sometimes it'll be flipped if you have another mirror in your system or whatever, you know. But it's it's a it's a vertical thing only, yes. It would be impossible to correct it for two and change it at the same time. I think you're I mean I I think you're right. I don't know the math and all that stuff. But actually the, the way those work is the, the prisms uh, they work off the index of refraction of an index of refraction of like glass or you know it exists with water when you have water and cup and stick a pencil in it, it looks like the pencil is bent, right? That's because the the different density between the air and the water the interface, right, what refracts the light. That's the same thing the atmosphere does. Space works with vacuum in the atmosphere. Uh, at the interface of the atmosphere acts like the interface of the water, and it's more of a refraction of what actually happens at the interface. Um, and because of the material, um, I assume basically they use different types of glass, yes. uh, depending on how expensive they are and things of that nature. Um, you know, one might use just traditional four silicate glass or some use pyrex or so they use quartz or something like that. silicate here this is uh back seven i think glass and i don't even know what's going to do this something about it right so and each type of material has a different index of refraction so it bends and aligns differently and by aligning those at, uh, at different angles um you can basically or whatever altitude the object is, um, you can basically then correct that, correct the refraction of the atmosphere. So, once you, once you hear about it, it seems almost obvious. Yeah, of course you have to hear the first. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Area. Okay, so we got the good events. Now, one thing that you notice here is that, like the ZWO, it didn't. It's, that thing is still centered, so it's, it's still looking purple. Well, when you, it, it's really hard to do it. I, I, I didn't have anything that I could show you with exactly, so I just, you know, our pointer, I stand from, reflects it. So that's, now I'm gonna, now this one, I should show you this again. This only has one knob. Well, this knob allows you to, you know, change, change the orientation of it. Tighten that back up again. But this only has one knob. And unlike, unlike the Piero Astro or the Great Star, this knob doesn't move, doesn't move side to side. It only spins. That's all it does. It just spins. And they want you to put this with the knob facing up. And you, you can look at it, there's a zero there and a yellow line, and you want that right there facing you when it's observing. But this one, he doesn't care. You can turn it around. Goodigan, Dr. Goodigan says specifically, it doesn't matter which, if you put this in forwards or backwards, it's still gonna do the same thing. So, as you, I think you might have noticed the first time, this thing, it didn't change the location like it did on, on the Piero Astro. This one, you turn this one and a half times and it reaches maximum dispersion. So, 
One and a half. Wait, it didn't move. Didn't move. The others move. So that's one of the reasons. Now, the others are iterative process where you try to tune it in, then you have to move your telescope to get it back in, you know, because it's just kept moving around, right? This is going to go outside your eye view. So you have to keep moving it, then try to refocus it, and move it, refocus it. By then, 15 minutes has passed, and now you got to refocus again because it's a different part of the atmosphere, 15 degrees higher. But this good occurrence, because the plane plates that they use, it doesn't move. It doesn't, it stays in the same place in your eyepiece. That is worth a lot. And this one, I put it at one and a half, and the blue is on the right now, the red is on the left. I don't know if you can see that when I reflect it, but the blue is on the right. It was dead center before. I've done it one and a half times, so I'm going to turn it one and a half times again, and that takes it back. And here, I know it's hard for right. you to see from there, right over but the here, top. back to center. Uh, Turn it one and a half times again. And it's gone the other way. And now the blue is slightly on the left. It's kind of hard to see, but the blue is on the left or the right. So it's moving the blue with regard to the red. And that's the whole point of these things. And that's why I wanted to show you this stuff with lasers. Now, and now I've heard that the last one is back to center. For all these, essentially, you're doing this manually throughout the observing night. And so these aren't electronically controlled or anything like that? Only that one PAEC from a Sun, Sun Observer, I think, was the one that made it. You can find it on gutech.com in Japan. But the Sun Observer one uh, was electronic. The rest of these, yeah, you do it by hand. As it moves through the sky, you're going to have to keep focus, just like you do with your focus order when the sky conditions change. Yeah, so you're going to have to, it's just like the focus order, you're going to have to play with this. So we've got Saturn up in the sky tonight. Uh, can we try it out? Um, well, that one's actually Dave Miller. If he's all right with it, then um, no, I hate to be responsible for somebody else's stuff. One other thing, like I told you, this is one of uh, Don Leonard's series of. Uh, what, did he, what did he call it? Innocent? No, young minds? No, um, childlike minds? Something like that. People who don't know everything coming out here and giving you guys a talk. But like I said, I like to see how these things go together, so I want to show you that. I said you can do it for imaging or for, uh, or for visual. So that's the last thing I want to do here, is just show you how we put some together. And I want to introduce you to how many people have any Botter Planetarium here? That's where, you, if you get one of these, I recommend you buy the Botter Planetarium, Botter Planetarium T2, Tango T2 diagonals. This one, they have two, they have different grades. I mean, they have prisms, they have, this one is their highest grade, it's like BDHS. They have uh, another standard kind that's still very, that's in fact, this one is the other kind, the other kind there. That's a Botter also. Why am I saying these? Well, because these things are these things are modular, and they fit T2 connections. Now I got a two-inch nose piece. This is the same one, inch and a quarter nose piece. They all work on T2 connections. So this is why the bottom. I'm going to use this one last because I want to show you how I set mine up. Got to play with these things. So they're all T2 connections. T2, anybody does camera photography? T2 connections all over the place there. And that's one reason they're doing this. So we'll take, uh, and we'll take uh, this, take out the T2 connection. Put on an ADC, which also, all of these have T2 connections. Put that T ADC, screw that right on. Hopefully you can get that thing so it's facing the horizon when it's in a central position. Now, like I said, you need a Barlow to get the back focus. So I'm going to, better than a Barlow is a Teleview power base. And the power mates, you can, you know, just use an eyepiece, instant a quarter eyepiece, or you can put a T2 adapter on it. 
So if you're telling you buy a power mate, I'd say get a T2 adapter, put that on here, and I'll screw that right into my got the T2 adapter right into the ADC right here. You've got a Barlow if you if you got too much back focus. And then you can put a extension on it. You got yourself something that you can do visually. You want to do some, let's say you want to do some, uh, oh, by the way, I want to point out, you don't need a two inch. And like I said, back focus can be a problem. You take this inch and a quarter compared to the two inch, it's, it's not even a comparison. You're going to have an inch or more extra light path with the smaller, with the smaller, you know, these two inches have a lot more stuff. So don't use a two inch, use an inch and a quarter. So if I'm going for a uh, camera, I can go, that's not two X. I'm gonna take another, this is a four X power mate, Telemi power mate. So it's like a four X Barlow, except these make the, the uh, light rays a little more parallel. Put the T2 connector on that. A little camera here. Well, maybe maybe we need some more back focus. Well, put a T2 50 millimeter extension there. Maybe you would put your uh, other your your off axis guider or filter wheel or whatever else you put in your night crawler assemblies. You can have that if you need more. If you need more space, you can put you know you can put more on it. You can. So that's you know you can do your. Photography was something like that. The way I do it, and I got this one, it's got a special top, a quick release top, but uh, I use my goose pins right here. And I'll tell you what, this is a pretty view once you see it. Someday I'll bring it out. Okay, now look at this. I just put this on here, but it's not on the top. So like I said, oh, it's here. I'm moving around there. <laughs> so, so this knob is supposed to be on the top, and it's off to the side. So the scooter pins has this turn. I just loosen this up, adjust it to where I want it to go, and bingo, we're in business. I put a 2X Marlow on my, or power made on mine. I was going to bring a can of like a, a box of like tin cans and stuff, and then just like drop stuff in there. So it would go. <laughs> All right, and then I do, I also, uh, ah. that's right. Take this back. I don't use you for our camera, I use you for my visual. I put a two, I put a two inch extension on it, otherwise, it doesn't come to focus right. And I got the quick release here to put, it's a bio view, just take up a lot of back focus. <laughs> and yet, there it is, this works. Put the quick release, Bobber has the quick release also, it's got a lot of this fancy stuff. Bobber Planetarium, eh, come on, I want to screw that more. There we go. And then that's a, another visual. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, this is one of the two things between uh, the two inch and the one inch uh, on an angle looking at. Um, what you said, the one inch the diagonal. Oh, oh. Yep, 
two basic sizes of diagonals, the inch and a quarter diagonal for the inch and a quarter eyepiece, and you got the two inch diagonal that will hold two inch eyepieces. And this two inch diagonal, because of the size of it, it just takes, it's, it's just got more room that, that the light has to go through and back out here. It, it takes up, it takes more room, more of your light path, more of your back focus that you can use to get into focus. Yes? I noticed, uh, I'm, I'm looking at Frazier's here. You're welcome. What about some of your thought of the correction? Is that the same thing? Or is that something? No. Coma correction corrects the telescope faults. Um, this corrects the atmosphere. Okay. And you, Go ahead. And you know, I screwed this up. I uh, didn't put a an ABC in the light path of the camera, but this is how we do it. I want to, I want, I want you to just watch for a second, because this is kind of interesting. I'm going to screw this ABC on here. Oh, sorry, I'll get back over <laughs> where I told you I was going to be. Now I've got this ABC, now i just got to put the ABC onto the uh, camera assembly, right? You can't put two female ends together. The ZWO ABC, if you're going to buy it, you're going to need to buy a T2 male to male connector. So that you can take this female and screw that on and then put your camera on. Now it works. Now. So if you buy the ZWO, make sure you get that T2 connector. Sorry. Did I interrupt your question? I'm kind of all over right now. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to know is how blown away you are with the sharp views that you're getting. Okay, so how blown? Okay, yeah. so yeah. like I said, when I when I tried with this, uh, and like I said, I might have gotten bad with Piero Astro, and I had I had to I had to hunt to get this thing because I was reading it was a lot better than the ZWO, and I wasn't happy. I'm like. Huh. I don't get it. And then uh, the Gutekunst. I thought, anybody here of tech telescopes, telescope engineering company? High end, way high end telescope. So I, I, I'm a, I, I follow their forums. And Yuri Petrunin, who makes tech telescopes, he came from Ukraine uh, 20 some years ago, set up in Golden, Colorado. And he started raving about this. And this guy makes immense talent, I mean, he's one of the premier telescope makers in the world. And he's, so, and then I started reading some of the people that are in his group that have these, the cheapest telescope he's got is like $7,500. And he's got, he's got them that can go up into, I don't even know expensive, how expensive, but like 25,000, 50,000, and I know he's got something more expensive than that too. He makes things for the government. So some of his, some of his, uh, buyers followed on their forum and these people started raving about it too and some of them I have I have seen their work before and I'm like I'm gonna take I'm gonna jump I'm gonna take a chance and I got it out and I put it in this lineup with a bino viewer with I mean and this is a high-end bino viewer too the power made just like this and I put that thing on Jupiter and I was giddy I'm like I will forget eventually how much I spent for that good comes to the 80 stage. <laughs> but I will always know how good the view is that I'm getting from it. I'm telling you, you will say, I was never in focus before. That's that's what it that's what it was to me. I'm like, I, I was never in focus. So that's what you focus with this thing, you focus with your agency. And I, I recommend it personally. And, and like I said, if you have a little telescope, don't bother with this. When you get a bit more, unless you start getting into um, Photography, the imaging. The well, imaging is going to pick up more stuff. Uh, the light behind between the small telescope. Well, for visual, they're usually saying four inches. I, I don't know what it is exactly. They're saying you're definitely going to need more than four, four inches or more. Uh, for photography, you know, that's that that's a big iris to be seeing. And so I, I don't know what the limits are for that. But if you're going to be doing imaging, I think you should do it. Think about at least trying the cheaper one because that CWO one is not bad. Except you got to keep re iter iteratively moving it as you focus it. 
But for visual work, when you're looking through it, like you got an eight inch telescope, you put it on a, a Newtonian or something like that. Are you going to notice a difference? They say you will. They say you'll notice on anything. Now the okay. Newtonians, the Dobbs and the Newtonians, you're going to have to, the SCTs and everything, you, you, you uh, set up the same way, you know, like this level will be on top. But the Newtonians and the Dobbs, it's got some, it, it's on their websites, but it's some complicated, I don't have a Dobb. I'm a refractor guy. And so I, it's something about you look through the eyepiece and see where the horizon would be and then adjust this to that. And I, I didn't follow it because I don't look at that. Yeah. I, I don't. Yeah, maybe you can just use this look for the drawing plane and adjust this for You what? Just look at something in the horizon. The look, look at something on the horizon in the telescope. So you just set up the telescope in the horizon. You can adjust this or adjust this first. Yeah, it's a, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah. A building or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Do the automatic ones get rid of all this coating and you never have those? The electronic one? Yeah. The EADC. Uh, and that one, I just remember it was like $500. Uh, that one, what they say you send up and you're going to have to focus it, you're going to have to tell it what's what. And then, according to uh, their uh, advertising, it'll do it all from there forever. You just have to set it up once they say. Yes. What was the size of your telescope out here? The oh, I did it with the one that gave me the amazing view was a four and a half inch, uh, 150 millimeter, and then I did it with a 140 millimeter, and it was just like I'm never going to look through anything else. You know, it's just, you just, uh, it's good. So, so what did you bring tonight? I didn't bring it until I was so I was getting ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring a telescope. Yeah. It's clear. Does anybody have a big? Request? I know it's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It's and I mean, I, I, okay. There's a bunch of things that I didn't get to because I kept forgetting, and I was yeah. trying to put it together to make it not too long, which is long enough, I'm sure. But uh, I don't know. Look it up if you're interested. Ask me questions if you want to. Anybody got more? That's all for me. Okay.